So welcome back. This is the second in a series of three talks. And I'm going to be focusing um, this time on leading through others. Last time we were looking at learning through pain, this time leading through others. And we're going to be particularly looking at the book of Ephesians and Colossians and remembering Paul's third mission journey. These churches were planted in Paul's third journey. And this is perhaps the most extraordinary um, kind of culmination of learning for Paul. And um, when I think about what lockdown has been like for many of us, I think there are different people who have responded in different ways. And some of that has been to do with the people around us. When I look around at churches that have developed leaders, particularly lay leaders, and how they've got structures around them where they've given away ministry and trained people and released them into ministry. Those churches um, tend to be thriving in ways where um, churches that haven't developed leaders as much are perhaps more struggling. Now, that's not to say that, um, you know, just because you haven't developed leaders means that, you know, that's a, that's a problem. I think it might be just to do with your circumstances or how new you are to the role or whatever. But, um, if you want your church to grow, if you want to have an impact on the wider community, then developing leaders is a key part of certainly what Paul had discovered. And as we read uh, these um, with this lens through uh, Acts chapter 19 and 20, which is um, the story of Ephesus, but also the impact on a whole region, I think we begin to see that it's something that we can learn from today as well. So as we start this next talk, I'm going to pray and then we will um, dive in to the story. Father, thank you for the book of Philippians and Paul's experience on that second mission journey and his relationship, that beautiful relationship with that church. And thank you as we look ahead now to the story of uh, the church in Ephesus and its impact on a whole region. Um, on the book of, uh, and the letter of Ephesians and Colossians, again written in Paul's lockdown in Rome. We pray that you would stir us afresh, help us learn some of the lessons that Paul himself had learnt. And may we in our own lockdown begin to apply it afresh in our own lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, Three things I want to look at in this talk about leading through others. First of all, uh, leadership development. We'll look at a little bit of what was, uh, Paul was doing. Then I want to look at multiplication, a principle that is a key um, thing that each one of us can do if we just tweak the way we think. And um, is that a, an American word, tweak? Anyway, make that serious adjustment. <laughs> and then um, getting ready for spiritual warfare, which I touched on in the last talk. So first of all, leadership development or leading through others. So when we um, develop leaders, what we're trying to do is to develop high capacity, high performing, um, high quality leaders. But every leader, including myself, whoever started out, um, always started out as a not high quality leader and a not a well-formed leader and someone who is just starting out. Because the reality is that all of us need to grow, all of us need to develop as leaders. Um, I've uh, personally found um, a, a, a thing called the Leadership Square really helpful, which is about um, leaders who are unformed to start with, who are kind of high on vision, but really not knowing what the impact's going to be. But then um, uh, when they turn a corner and they get to see what the, the reality is going to be like and how much they've got to learn and how far they've got to grow, it's like you can get discouraged and you need encouragement and coaching. And that's the second um, uh, line of the square. The third line of the square, getting around that second corner, so important as we learn to press through in our learning so that we learn to be become competent as leaders, still needing encouragement and, and um, feedback, but we become competent in our leadership enough so that when we get to that fourth stage, um, if you like the fourth line of the square, we are 
competent and don't even think about um, the way we're leading because we're doing it completely naturally. We've learned to be a high performing, high quality um, leader, but we've had to go through those steps in order to get there. So when people say, oh, I don't have any leaders in my church, it's because you haven't got any well-formed leaders perhaps, but you've got lots of unformed leaders who are waiting to be called out, wait, waiting to be coached and encouraged, waiting to be released into ministry and, and supported by you, but also waiting to be, um, to be uh, entrusted with the things which you're doing right now. And as soon as you go through that cycle, as soon as you develop people, they will become high performing, high quality leaders. And it all starts with apprenticeship. I talked a little bit about this before, but the heart of apprenticeship is disciple making. And we see here in Paul's experience in Ephesus, a city he was longing to get to. He goes at the end of the second um, mission journey just to visit on the way back to Jerusalem and Antioch. He comes back in the third journey. He know his sights are set on Ephesus and he arrives. And um, in Acts chapter 19, the story is picked up. I'm just going to read the, the beginning um, verses of, of, of the um, story of uh, the, the church in Ephesus. While Paul, Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior, that's through um, Asia Minor, um, and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There are about 12 men in all. Paul leads these people to Christ and, and prays for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he takes them into the synagogue and he speaks to um, Jewish uh, people and tries to persuade them about Jesus. After a few weeks, um, some people are following him, some people aren't. And so he moves into a, a building next, call, next door called the Hall of Tyrannus. Um, some of them you know, become obstinate and they refuse to believe, um, uh, Luke writes in um, Acts chapter 19 verse 9. And so Paul left them, he took the disciples with him and had daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So what's going on in the hall of Tyrannus or Tyrannus? Well, Paul is speaking to this group of disciples every day. He is discipling them. He is helping them to follow Jesus. He's taking them through the scriptures. He's sharing his life with them. He's doing the things which he knew how to do. He'd learned how to do on the other mission journeys. It's like we've learned in our ministries how to do things and we've refined that and refined that so we know what we're doing. And Paul had learned how to disciple people. Um, in 2 Timothy um, We'll, we'll be looking at this tomorrow, but 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, um, Paul writes to Timothy. This is the last, one of the last things he wrote um, in his life. He says, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people um, who will be also qualified to teach others. So you've got here Paul speaking to Timothy, who he encourages to teach reliable people who are able to teach others. Paul to Timothy to reliable people to others. Four stages of disciple making. It's like Paul has learnt how to disciple people, to help them to disciple people, to help them to disciple people. There's something about um, an encouragement that we need to make. We need to be those who disciple others, but also we need to be encouraging disciples to disciple others as well. So a key question for you might be, who are you discipling? That's something we can respond to ourselves. And as leaders, we must be doing that. We should perhaps be drawing in leaders that we can encourage and disciple. But one of the questions we can ask them then is who are you discipling? So that disciple making continues. I think that's what was going on here. 
That's what Jesus did. He discipled um, his disciples. And then remember in Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Again, that, that um, disciple making thing. I'm discipling you. I mean, I'm telling you to go and disciple others and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. What's that? To disciple people. So teach them to disciple others. And in them teaching others, they will teach others and so on. This is how we come to be disciples ourselves today, because we're part of that ongoing cycle. But also, um, you know, so we see Paul doing the same thing, and, and there's a focus on people, and there's a focus on people going deep. Paul does it daily. He, he keeps on teaching the church again and again, over and over again, um, um, every day, teaching new things, rehearsing old things, helping them kind of work through things. Who are you discipling? And he also makes space in this for the miraculous. You know, we see here um, in Acts chapter 19 um, how Paul um, is involved in praying for the sick. Um, so verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. We see um, people um, being healed of um, illnesses, um, spirits being driven out of people, um, evil spirits being driven out of people. So this is something that has had an impact on people's lives. You know, I love the way um, when he's writing to the Ephesians in um, Ephesians chapter 5, um, he says uh, in, in verse 17, don't get, sorry, verse 18, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Here he's, this is discipleship language. But remember how this church started by being filled with the Holy Spirit. They'd heard about um, the need to repent um, and follow John's baptism, but they needed to be led to Christ and then filled with the Holy Spirit. And so this is a church, Paul is reminding them, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you need to disciple people. And they're intricately bound with one another. When we're filled with the Spirit, we begin to see with God's eyes. We begin to see God's opportunities that he leads to us and, and leads us to be able to know who to pray for, how to pray, and to believe in faith that people will not just come to faith, but also be healed, transformed, delivered, whatever it is um, that they need. And this was a spiritual city. You know, Ephesus um, had the Temple of Artemis um, on a hill. It was um, one of the seven wonders of the world. And there was a whole temple cult around this, um, around this temple. And people following him, that's how Paul got into trouble later on in Acts um, chapter 20, because um, people start losing, they, they're threatened by their livelihood because they think the trinkets um, that are sold around the temple are going to lose um, their kind of street value because of the number of people who are coming to Christ. And so they cause a riot um, saying, you know, the Christian faith is, is, is kind of taking away our livelihood. But the, the temple cult, there was a spiritual place. It was a deeply spiritual place. And Paul is writing to the Ephesians and saying, you need to put the full armor of God on. When you're in a spiritual battle, you've got to deal with this head on. You've got to um, face the spiritual battle that we face. And I think in the midst of coronavirus, it's not just a virus that's affecting us physically. This is a virus that's affecting us spiritually. It's almost like um, one of the things that we're noticing in England is that what was true before coronavirus hit us, but was hidden, is now coming to light. So churches that were struggling, um, but somehow we didn't really know what was going on, now are really struggling because um, it's almost like they're laid bare. The churches that were heavily invested in disciple making and, and in prayer and so on, when coronavirus hit, actually it's come to light, that depth of relationship with God, that disciple making, that desire to give away responsibility and to disciple and, and develop leaders it has really come through. And so for us, as we face that, um, face and lean into that spiritual battle alongside this tragic virus, actually, what is God saying to us? What is he wanting us to strengthen in our own spirit? What is he wanting us to pray into so that we can grow in our own faith? We can help others to grow in their faith. We can help them to resist the evil one. We can even see people delivered from oppression and um, evil that's affecting them as well. And so in terms of developing others and developing leaders, developing leaders is a subset of developing disciples. 
And so with leaders, we take them round that leadership square in the same way that we might help a disciple to grow in faith. We're giving them opportunities to learn. We're giving them opportunities and responsibility to lead. And then we're entrusting with that. We're not just leaving them um, to do it on their own. We're walking alongside them just as Jesus did with the disciples. And then we're um, helping put some good boundaries in place and releasing them into leadership and then giving them feedback and helping them to thrive in that place. And then uh, when they've gone through that cycle, they're in, in a place not just to be leaders in their own right, but actually to start developing other leaders themselves. They can start apprenticing people. So I asked the question, who are you discipling? But I also asked that question, who are you apprenticing? Who are you apprenticing as a leader in the church? But also, this is a question you can ask leaders in the church, lay leaders, who are you apprenticing? Who's your apprentice that you can come alongside, that you can disciple, that you can develop in leadership to not just be able to um, do what you're doing, but multiply what you're doing and um, actually even give away in church planting terms. So developing others will involve um, leadership development and attracting high quality leaders who are formed by you. The other thing we see on this journey is extraordinary multiplication. Um, Paul is able to accomplish more by multiplying himself many, many times. There's a really interesting thing that comes out in um, Acts, um, that, um, in Acts chapter 19 and 20, where we see here that Paul never left the city. He never left Ephesus, and yet Luke is able to write in verse 10 of um, Acts chapter 19, this lecturing in the Hall of Tyrannus went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. All the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's the whole of Western Turkey today. That's all the cities that actually we read about in Revelation 2 and 3. The, remember the seven um, churches that are, uh, are talked about um, that John writes letters to and, and Jesus writes through John. So, you know, these are all planted during that time. And yet Paul never leaves Ephesus. How has every, um, every Jew and Greek heard the word of the Lord in the whole region? It's through church planting, through churches established in, in cities and towns and villages. But also they've been achieved through Paul sending disciples who have become leaders and who have become church planters. We know this. One example is the story of Epaphras. So turn with me to Colossians. Um, Colossians uh, was written to the church in Colossae, um, which is um, some distance from Ephesus, um, east of there. And we read these words. Um, verse 6 of Colossians 1. All over the world, this gospel that you've heard is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. So here's Epaphras. Paul hasn't told the Colossians about Jesus. Epaphras has. So who's Epaphras? Well, we learn that Epaphras is from this, this area and he must have ended up in Ephesus, maybe on business, I don't know. But he is obviously brought to Christ. He is trained as a disciple um, under Paul. And then he is trained as a leader because he's sent back to Col Colossae to plant the church in Colossae. In fact, he's also involved in planting a church in Laodicea, a um, very, very close by um, city, and Hierapolis, another um, city close by. He's the person who's planted those churches. So here we have Paul training a church planter to go out on his behalf to plant churches. Um, and obviously that kept on going, that multiplication happened. So remember the multiplication that is possible as soon as I say, who are you apprenticing? And make that part of my apprenticeship of, of the person I'm training. There's a disciple, there's a multiplication factor in there. So if I say to an apprentice, who are you apprenticing? They're apprenticing someone and they'll say to them, who are you apprenticing? And so you've got a multiplication effect of what you're doing. And same with disciple making. If I um, disciple someone and say, who are you discipling? They will say, well, I'm not sure. And they'll start asking God, who can I disciple? They're discipling them. And of course, one of the questions they will ask is, who are you discipling? Again, a multiplier. So you can multiply your ministry through disciple making, through leadership development, through church planting, 
by um, using this principle that Paul had discovered. Paul, I think, discovers it um, on the second and third journeys, where he stays in one place, but he's able to multiply his effect and impact all over this whole province. We've got to relearn that lesson. It's a spiritual principle. Jesus um, talks about it when he talks about the parables of the, of the grain of wheat that dies, falls into the ground and multiplies, producing a crop 30, 60, 100 fold. It's all through Paul's ministry. It's through Paul's encouragement to Timothy to, um, to uh, find reliable people who are able to teach others. That multiplying impact. Who are you apprenticing and multiplying through? Who are you discipling and multiplying through? This is a lesson for us to learn. And it's a particular lesson we can try out in lockdown. This is the time to try this out, to learn to lead, not just others, but to lead through others to other people who are further on still. So Paul has learnt this. He's learnt this lesson and we can relearn it for ourselves afresh. But I think there is an inevitable cost to this level of maturity of leadership. You know, Paul is seeing tens, perhaps hundreds of churches being planted just in a two or three year period. The whole of Asia has heard the word of the Lord. And when you put your, um, an English expression here, but to put your head above the parapet, when you're sticking your head up above the crowd, you can get shot down. You can be identified as a target by the enemy. And Paul, I think, um, has experienced this. Um, he knows that Ephesus is a dark place. You know, he writes in um, Ephesians about the armour of God, as I said before. And Luke points towards some of the trials that Paul experienced personally on this journey. You know, he, he, he just touches on it where he, um, he just says, you know, there were people speaking against him. There's, um, you know, there's this riot where he's one step removed and he's, he's forbidden for, uh, from, by the church from getting involved in it because he would be perhaps um, whipped or, um, you know, stoned or something like that. But elsewhere in the scriptures, we read about some of the things that Paul might have experienced. So in 1 Corinthians, this was written um, uh, after this event, after he's um, been to Ephesus. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. So this is a second visit. Because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. There are many who oppose me. So he's experiencing strong opposition. Have you experienced strong opposition in your ministry? Again, in that same letter, but um, a few verses before. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. We read this. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. So just at the beginning of that, that verse, I fought wild beasts in Ephesus. What do you think was going on? Did he just kind of walk into the countryside and get attacked by wild animals? Maybe. But he says it so specifically here that I wonder if this is perhaps a reference to the games that happened, the Roman games, where prisoners were taken hold of and um, put into the arena. Um, and to the crowd's amusement, wild beasts were allowed to roam and attack people. People would be mauled sometimes to death for people's amusement. When Paul writes about being attacked by wild beasts, was that what was going on? He faced strong opposition. I think sometimes the burdens are so heavy in this ministry that um, he loses strength. So he talks in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 um, and verse um, 8. He says these words. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. That's where Ephesus is. 
We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered, delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us, as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. You know, he loses his strength and despairs even of life itself. This was the cost of this kind of ministry, of stepping out, of putting his head above the parapet, of seeing huge multiplication, huge impact, huge blessing in the midst of um, an extraordinary growth of the church. You know, I talked about in the last talk, the throne of Satan. He was taking on the throne of Satan. I wonder what that was. It's like perhaps a concentration of demonic power in a particular place. All the spiritual forces in Asia took a toll on him as a leader. And if he hadn't been prepared on that second journey of experiencing suffering, again, I don't think he would have been ready for what he needed to face on this journey. He needed depth of character and the lessons of reproductive ministry um, from the second journey to the third in order to survive it, and not just survive it, but thrive in it. So I think leaders who have experienced this kind of challenge have extraordinary spiritual authority. Leaders who have suffered, leaders who um, step into um, a multiplication of growth and impact on on, the, uh, on really kind of um, investing in prayer and disciple making and leadership development. When you're seeing yourself giving yourself away to others and seeing them giving away to others, the huge impact that can have is basically a threat to the kingdom of, of darkness. And so there will be a cost for us. And yet Paul knows that this cost is worth it. He knows that this is part of what it means to be a leader in God's church. And there is a there's a spiritual authority that is carried when people um, live through that. And it's only carried when people have gone through hardships of this kind. You, know, you can't buy authority like this. It, it, it's carried through the shedding of tears, of blood sometimes, of difficulty and challenge. It's clear and evident to everyone. There are no shortcuts on this journey. And, you know, third journey people, third journey leaders, you can tell what they've been through. You can tell the impact that they've had on others. And um, you can see the impact of that, um, of their ministry. It's powerful, it's dynamic, it spreads across a whole region. You know, I think as I reflect on leaders in this country, We've got lots of first journey and second journey leaders, people who have um, planted churches or done amazing things in their ministries, but they haven't got as far as a third journey leader where they're seeing multiplication, they're seeing huge impact. And I just wonder whether it's because they're not ready to lean in to that challenge. And God is calling us, even as we read these words together, he's calling us to step into that kind of uh, leadership. You know, we, we long to see reproduction of disciples and multiplication of disciples in this nation. I wonder if that's the same for you in the States. I long to see leaders who are prepared to carry a burden of responsibility, um, who are prepared to suffer in the name of Christ. I long to see a church that is prepared to stand against the grain to stand against um, the weight of expectations of living in a particular way, of speaking in a particular way, and sometimes challenging those in authority to say, actually, we're going to live a Christ-like way. And you know, I think this is a time for us um, in, in England, as, as much as it is a, a time in the States for you to do the same, to say, actually, we need to stand up and be counted, even if it means being unpopular, even if it means being challenged and, um, uh, and misunderstood, but to stand up for what we believe, to stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ, to even to suffer. So as we reflect on 
Ephesians. I've only kind of scraped the surface with all that we could touch on. The book of Colossians, you know, I love, we had it read in our wedding, but the, um, in Colossians, how Paul is encouraging them after doing this extraordinary treatise about, you know, who Christ is and the importance of the Son. He then says, as God's dearly, uh, as God's chosen people, verse uh, 12 of chapter 3, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, as Paul writes those words, he's thinking about what he's taught all the churches. He's thinking about what he taught the church in Ephesus He's thinking about what he's taught to Epaphras, who has passed it on to that church. How are you developing leaders? How are you discipling people? How are you encouraging them to disciple others and them to apprentice other leaders? Could this be something that you can, um, you can invest in yourself? And actually, what do you need to focus on? What are the things that only you can do? And how can you give away the rest. In a way, I think a good question to ask is when you go, what will remain? You know, for Paul, he was able to go to, after three years, he was able to go to Jerusalem and he left a thriving church there that um, continued for many decades um, in, in an extraordinary way, still impacting its region. What's going to be left behind when you move on to your next calling? What is your discipleship plan? How can you use this time of lockdown for you to disciple a group of people and perhaps to encourage them to disciple other people? Could you start with your own leaders and develop them to be more effective leaders themselves? And what is the spiritual cost of stepping into multiplication, of stepping into um, this spiritual battle? What is the spiritual cost on you and how are you bearing up on it? Are you prepared, as Paul was, um, with the Ephesians. He says, you know, to bear with one another. Bear with one another. Carry each other's burdens. This is something for us to live into as clergy, as leaders um, in the Diocese of Central Florida.